Hey there. Hey. How are you doing? Fine. How are you? I'm good. Very well. I'm just waiting for the go ahead. Okay, there you go. Boa noite a todos, sejam bem-vindos a ler Olhos nos Olhos, uma iniciativa da Câmara Municipal de Oeiras e da Rede de Bibliotecas Nacionais Municipais de Oeiras, que conta com a produção executiva da Book Company. Uh, do outro lado do ecrã, tenho o prazer de estar acompanhado por Paulo Giordano, a quem saúdo e agradeço. Thank you, Paulo, for being here with us. It's a pleasure. We'll speak Obrigado. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> We'll speak shortly. My only word in Portuguese, of course. Yeah, <laughs> we'll speak shortly. Uh, but first, let me share uh, with our viewers a few details about you and your work. Uh, Paulo Giordano nasceu em Turim em 1982. Filho de um ginecologista e de uma professora de inglês. Tem uma irmã, Cecília, que é mais velha do que ele de três anos. Licenciou-se em Física na Universidade de Turim, onde ganhou uma bolsa de doutoramento em Física de Partículas. Em 2008, venceu o Prémio Strega, pelo seu romance de estreia A Solidão dos Números Primos. Foi, de resto, o escritor mais jovem a ser galardoado com o Prémio Literário de Maior Prestígio em Itália. Tinha, então, 26 anos. O livro recebeu vários prémios, como o prémio Campiello Opera Prima, tendo sido traduzido em mais de 40 línguas. A solidão dos números primos foi também adaptado ao cinema em 2020, 2010, assim é que é, pelo realizador Saverio Costanzo. Em Portugal há ainda traduções dos livros Negro e Prata e, mais recentemente, Frente ao Contágio, ambos editados pela Relógio de Água. A Ler Olhos nos Olhos é uma iniciativa que tem como parceiros a UCLA, União das Cidades Capitais de Língua Portuguesa, o Centro Nacional de Cultura em Portugal, a Livraria Martins Fontes no Brasil, Camões, Centro Cultural Português em Maputo, a Feira do Livro Filipoços no Brasil, Sempre um Papo no Brasil, também a Fliarachá do Brasil, a Academia Cabo Verdiana de Letras de Cabo Verde, ainda a PEN Guiné-Bissau, a Pusfácio Brasileira, a Fundação Fernando Leite Couto de Moçambique, a Bienal do Livro de Pernambuco no Brasil. Durante a conversa, façam-nos chegar as vossas perguntas para o Paulo de Jordano através do Facebook. Paulo, welcome again. And sorry for this introduction in Portuguese. Our conversation will be in English uh, because my Italian is, well, pretty bad. So let's let's <laughs> move on in English, if you don't mind. Let me start by asking you about Frente ao Contagio, the book you wrote on the new coronavirus. You wrote from a privileged uh, standpoint uh, which is a country badly hit by the pandemic, Italy, of course. How hard was it to keep the narrative flowing while the events unfolding uh, were unfolding right before your eyes? Well, uh, it was a sadly privileged uh, point of view. I, I wrote the book very early in the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. I started it on February 29, and just a week before the first cluster of uh, contagions were, had been found in, in Italy, in uh, Voiogano in the north. So, uh, and I wrote the book in five days and nights. It was really a very hectic process. And I have to say that it was very clear to me at that point that the situation was uh, would become very bad uh, because the, the, it was very visible in, in the numbers, basically. But the health emergency hadn't really started at that point. It was just in the beginning. So there, it was we were in in those days that would come just a few few weeks later when we saw all those uh 
the counts of the dead people day by day rising and rising and reaching the thousands per day. And we were still quite far from the uh, coffins being taken out from Bergamo, an image that was shocking for, for our country, and I think for, for yeah. the whole Europe. Yeah. And so at that moment, when I wrote the book, everything was still in the imagination. And this book is a lot about the imagination that it takes to face an epidemic and a situation like this. Uh, because you, you know, we, we should have learned that one of the most difficult things is to be in sync with the pandemic, with the epidemic as it, go, as it develops, because we, we see consequences of what we do or don't do just a couple of weeks after or even mm -hmm. later on. So uh, everything is about foreseeing things. And in that moment, people were not foreseeing anything. People were still talking, arguing, even scientists were arguing. Some were saying, no, this is just a seasonal flu. Uh, it's now, there's no real danger. You're exaggerating the risk. And others were saying, uh, beware because this is big and it's going to mm, hit us very hard. But mm -hmm the population was really divided and confused. And that's why I wrote the book so fast and I tried to write it as clearly as I could. I wanted to explain things to people. Mm -hmm. And how prepared or badly prepared is the international community um, uh, to deal with the pandemic of these proportions? You argue uh, that this is not the first, nor the least, not even the most horrible pandemic. And yet it is argu arguably the quickest one to spread in a global scale, right? Well, it's for sure the, the first one in this modern world. The first one that, I mean, it took the coronavirus less than a couple of months to reach every corner of the world, all countries in the world. And this is a direct measure of how connected we've become in the last decades. Um, but at the same time, we did improve very efficient in dealing globally with this pandemic. I remember during the first wave uh, when Italy was already severely hit, And, and we were counting the deads. Other countries in Europe, not Portugal, uh, to be honest, because Portugal were, was quite efficient in the, in the, in the first wave of the, of the pandemic, but many other countries, they reacted with, this, with the same disbelief that we had the first uh, place. with respect to China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when when something was happening in China, in Europe, we were saying, okay, it's it's Death their problem. problem. We yeah, we have to look out for Chinese people traveling, and we were acting in a very crazy way, as if the uh, as if the virus could only hit Chinese people somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and then we we suddenly realized that it was among us and it was big and it was already widespread but then the other countries even our neighbor countries uh, they said okay there's there's an italian situation but there's never been an italian situation this has been a worldwide problem from the very beginning but it took us a long time to frame it this way uh, do you plan to write an update version of that book um, after uh, things settle down a little bit uh, in Italy or elsewhere? Or well, was it I've, just a one-off thing? No, actually I've kept on writing uh, throughout the whole, throughout the, 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 the last months. I've never really stopped. Uh, the, 
this short essay, I would say it was the start of a process that that's been going on and on. But I've been writing mainly um, articles for the newspaper. Some of them have been translated. But you know, with articles, it's always more difficult, as you know, because newspapers work day by day, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's very hard to uh, you know keep track with other countries in in that sense. But to me, it's been a a constant process and somehow I've been monitoring all the different steps of this epidemic from different angles and perspective um, because our behavior is changing so fast our comprehension of the of the problem is changing so fast and there is always so many there are always so many new things to that we need to understand that I've been basically doing this and not much more mm -hmm. from the end of February until now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you think uh, people in general uh, learn something uh, in dealing with this pandemic? Are there any valuable lessons that we can take from this uh, pandemic and if so are we um, able to take that those lesson, lessons seriously uh, in a way that we don't uh, repeat the mistakes that we've been making over the last few months well there are so many things that need to be learned, even in the long term. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a short term, short term thinking of the epidemic and there is a long term thinking. The short term thinking is the one that is uh, drawing all our attention and efforts. So we, we want to get out of this as soon as possible and solve this, uh, which is, uh, of course, it's it's natural and comprehensible. But uh, on the other hand, there is a long-term thinking which has much more to do with how and why we ended up like this in this pandemic, in this situation. It has to do with the structure of our civilization before the pandemic. And... And this is a very important thinking as well, but somehow it's not finding uh, space in the in the public debate mm -hmm. um, because we're also focused on the present. And you know, I, I've tried from from the very beginning to leave out some sort of moralistic view of the virus it's it's very easy to to see this all as some sort of lesson to learn or you know some sort of punishment that comes from above for our mistakes but i i don't want to give this importance to the virus i'm trying to to stick to a very uh, scientific view of the things i'm trying to be objective as i can and If you ask me if we're really learning how to deal with this, even in the short term, well, the second wave, at least in Italy, is somehow the uh, shows, it shows somehow that we were really able to, to, to learn from, from what happened in the spring because we, we found ourselves unprepared again uh, and during the summer what what really shocked me of the summer wasn't of course the fact that people wanted to get out and be free and gather i think that was very healthy somehow and but the the speed with which we seem to have forgotten everything 
that was quite shocking to me. I mean, mm -hmm. the, we, we had so many victims just a few weeks before, and then we found ourselves in some sort of big denial. And denial is the big problem of the second part of, of the epidemic, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm actually. Glad. I don't know how it is in 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 Portugal, but denial here has become a, a big issue for for dealing with it now. Yeah, it's gaining momentum uh, as we speak. Uh, that denial in Portugal, so it's a big problem. And I'm actually uh, glad that you uh, mentioned the um, the importance of science in dealing with uh, well a pandemic. Um, as opposed to have like a uh, denial standpoint, because I, I wanted to, to ask you, do you see yourself primarily as a scientist who writes books or the other way around? Uh, well, I, I don't practice science anymore and it's mm -hmm. been now 10 years, so I'm, I'm out of that world, but It's my background, uh, it's my main background. So I think I, I, I call myself a writer in the first place, of course, that's what I do. I, I write most of my time, but I'm very interested in science, in the sciences. Uh, this is something that I, uh, on one hand, I, I lost, something when I moved out of science because I'm now I'm not able anymore to read a scientific paper, a very detailed scientific paper in the field that I used to study. But what I had in return of that is that now I can be interested in all disciplines, in all different sciences, as I wasn't uh, during my years in at university. So I do read a lot and science somehow is always the starting point even of the novels that i write mm -hmm. uh, i i have a question here by a, a viewer uh, paulo pereira who asks uh, you told el país that after a great collective trauma we tend to forget as an instinct is it possible to forget such a thing like covid 19 much more than a collective trauma Well, apparently yes, and it's it's very easy to forget it, and it's and we're very quick and efficient at it. Uh, I think that will will be the the role of some writers in the future. Uh, you know, writers are to me are often those people who cannot forget, who have a problem with memory because they cannot forget some things so uh, some of the writers will have the role of keeping that memory alive and you know this is very different in in that sense uh, from a war we, we often call this a war because there yeah. are similarities but there are also differences and And one of the differences to me is that a war um, is hits our imagination stronger. Mm -hmm. um, this pandemic is very easy to be forgotten because it happens close to us, but for most of us, it's just uh, like a um, a bother a problem in the everyday life. Uh, okay, we need to be locked down, we have a curfew, uh, we need to be tested and maybe our kids uh, uh, have come into contact with someone so we need to quarantine, so it's a problem. And then we hear of someone who's been sick, even of someone who's died and maybe someone close to us, but it's, very easy to normalize this mm -hmm. and and the things happen in hospitals 
uh, far away from our eyes somehow. So I think we have a problem to feel this. In a war, there is this, like an enemy, a struggle, really something that you need to overcome. Um, here it's very difficult. It's it's very easy to feel divided and just at some point not to care that much about what's happening. And I think that's not fair because I mean many people are dying, many people are suffering, and many people are doing big sacrifices. And this is going to change things, um, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. Can we go back? Uh, I wanted to pull the scientific uh, strength here, if you if you don't mind. Can we go back in time a little bit to your most recognized books, so we can exp so you can explain once and for all what a prime number is? And uh, of course, I'm referring to uh, a solidão dos números primos. Well, a prime number is a. a is a number that is, is divisible only by itself and by one. So, well, we all know them, no? Two, three, five, seven, 11, so on and so forth. And you see, when you were asking me if I feel more like a scientist or more like a writer, uh, when I when my life was, mainly not in words, but in numbers and calculations. I used to give numbers a very defined shape and meaning, even a personality. And the whole idea behind that title and, uh, and those two characters comes from this, from, from the fact that Whenever you spend a lot of time in a place that's very lonely and uh, not populated, like physics, theoretical physics and maths, then you find your own companion. And my own companion, there were numbers and particles and all those things. Actually, the, the, the analogy... I still feel like a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the analogy between two human beings, uh, Alice uh, and Mattia, uh, and these special numbers, these prime numbers, uh, is extraordinary. Uh, how, how did you come up with this with this analogy? Uh, was that a part a, a result of your work as a a physic, like in the in the world of physics? Um, were you feeling alone? <laughs> doing your um, <laughs> doing your scientific work and you had to in some sense uh, give some personality to those numbers well you know math is a is a language mm -hmm. to me it's basically a language um, like Italian like Portuguese and if you learn to speak that language, then there are some things that you can say very precisely and some other things that uh, cannot be fully translated into other languages. You know, we, we also have those words that don't have an exact translation. There, there is the famous word in Portuguese, saudade, or however you pronounce it, that yeah. doesn't have ex an exact explanation in any other language. So we know it in its original uh, form and we use it in its original form. And the same happens in math. So there are things that happen there and that can be said with that code that cannot be exactly translated. and that problem in translation to me is the source of metaphors. You mm -hmm. can build beautiful metaphors using science because science has so many beautiful words, complicated and beautiful words that cannot be translated exactly and concepts. And prime numbers and twin prime numbers, which are 
sort of couples of prime numbers that send very close to each other. Or one of, the ide of those ideas that I just had into my mind. And when I was writing about these two lonely characters, at some point it, the, the analogy just came to me or it came to the mind of my character because uh, Mattia in that novel often thinks, often conceives of the reality in terms of calculations because it's a way to calm him down. And that happens to me as well. I use math, I used to use math as a form to calm down. Okay, I, I have another question by probably your biggest fan uh, uh, watching here in Portugal, Paul Pereira again. And this question uh, kind of overlaps with my previous question, but probably you'll have uh, something to add to the, to the question. About the solitude uh, of prime numbers, how did you come up with that story of fear and uh, fear of living and fear of loving? And also about the difficult times of adolescence. Well, uh, it's very hard for me now to uh, go back to the to the real um, the root. original idea of mm. the book because yeah, because so many years have passed. And, you know, books are not just. Uh, as th they not stay as they are uh, throughout time, but they, they ch somehow change with you and your perspective on, on the, 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 the stories you've written changes with you. But I wrote The Society of Prime Numbers when I was still very close to my um, formative years. So to my years as a teenager, I was just out of that part of life. So it felt all very uh, vivid and, and close. Uh, and I guess I would tell the, those years as years of loneliness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, doesn't mean that I was lonely because I didn't have friends or whatever, but <laughs> They just felt lonely, even among, even w with people. And mm -hmm. I think it's very common uh, and it's a an universal thing that even teenagers of today can relate to. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, the questions keep uh, coming up. I have another one by Rita França Ferreira who asks, uh, how different is to write this last book that is related with something that was occurring at the same time you were writing and your novels, uh, such as The Solitude of Prime Numbers? Uh, well, um, how Contagion works was a radical new experience for me. I had never written something so unexpected, so not planned, and so fast. Uh, I, I knew I didn't have time. Uh, I didn't have more than a few days to finish it because it was very clear that Italy would soon be in a lockdown. So there was a, a practical problem uh, for the book to be published because very soon that the, the 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 publishers were were able anymore to publish books so i had to be fast and i knew mm -hmm. it and that was completely new i couldn't i am usually i'm usually a very slow writer i tend to think over things over and over uh even too much but i just didn't have time to think and what was happening around me just um seemed so much important so much more important than any of my doubts and worries so i just did it and it felt good actually in that situation because it felt as if i was doing my small part 
in that process. Um, but after months of this, after months of just observing realities and reacting to reality and trying to process things as they happen, I really feel the need of going back to that uh, slowness of, of uh, writing novels. And that's what I plan to do very soon. Like try to close this chapter, uh, even if it won't be closed, but I'll try to do it to go back to a different pace. You know mm -hmm. what, that's really what I like about being a novelist that you can keep a pace that is different from the pace of the outside world from the pace of other things that is usually much faster and uh where everything burns much faster what can you tell us about the 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 future novel or the the future book that you'll write is is it i wish i had solid? something to tell no i haven't written a single word okay <laughs> Apart but from i do name. have a couple of i do have a couple of images mm -hmm. and you know i i usually rely a lot on images on visions uh and i respect them a lot so uh, i'll try to explore around them and see what happens i i have another question by uh one be beloved viewer viewer of this conversation but i'll try to squeeze in a, a question of mind of mine because uh, you you write an awful lot about solitudes and abandonment uh, that is again the case with Negro e Prata, the story of an an, an experienced couple. Uh, it immediately comes to my mind the first line of Love Will Tear Us Apart, the Joy Division song, which kicks off with When Routine Life Hard. Uh, you love the song? Yes. Okay, that's that's good to know. Do you think and there is a beautiful uh, there is a beautiful version that just came out? by the national if oh. you haven't listened to it i'll, I'll definitely yes. listen to that uh, right right after we finish our conversation but do you think this applies to nora and her husband or is it a stretch uh, that i that i did just here um you know as you said uh, i tend to write a lot about uh, loneliness i don't know why um my life is uh, apparently my life is better than that but a loneliness is very interesting to me and and that book is about a peculiar kind of loneliness because i think we can experience loneliness not only as individuals not only mm -hmm. as individual people but also as groups groups of people or, uh, for instance, as a as a couple, as a married couple, like the one that's in the book, um, you know, I've built a family in the years when I wrote that book. I had just built my my present family, and it's been um, a tough process because it's not it, it it's not been very linear. I would say so. My my wife came from a another marriage. She had two kids from her previous marriage, and she was going through a divorce with all the struggles and mm -hmm. um, okay, and the violence that a divorce always brings in. And so I, I was in this process, and I was trying to keep everything together. And I mean, not everyone around us was supportive. Uh, basically very few people were supportive so it often happened to us to feel lonely together in this thing and and that story and, and there was one person 
the 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 protagonist of um, uh, of that novel that was instead very close to us and not judgmental at all and then she became sick and 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 the book is basically about her last year of life and um, and when she died we felt even more lonely because we we were missing her support so that's yeah that's what the book is about it's about how hard it can be sometimes just to be yeah even to be two people who love each other in the world mm -hmm. routine is a huge part of uh, any scientific work uh, i i don't i don't know whether or not you you agree with this but the same i think applies with uh, uh, with love and relationships is there any chance of achieving an eureka moment in a relationship? Uh, uh, say it again, what kind of moment? Eureka. Ah. <laughs> well, there are many, mm -hmm. but sometimes they are so unexpected and so marginal. You know, they just happen and they are, and I think it's very important to be, to become uh, sensitive to the vibrations, small vibrations, because I mean, we can have big moments of happiness and accomplishment and union but more often i think it happens in very subtle movements very like non extraordinary moments and it takes some effort to recognize them and just uh take care of them mm -hmm. yeah not to waste them i'm not very good at it uh, honestly, but I do my best. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, so the, the question uh, that was uh, here waiting in line is by Paul Ferreira, uh, and he, he, he says, uh, in a parallel world, you can discover the theory of everything, or you can win the Nobel Prize in literature. Which one do you choose? <laughs> uh, it's very difficult, but I th I still think I would like to discover a fundamental law of nature more than everything. You know, something that bears my name, like the constant of that. That's always been my. It it, it just sounds so. Um, I mean, you cannot question it somehow. Mm -hmm. And then you well, can. Well, uh, it never, it will never happen, as as the other case will never happen. So, but if whatever you, I choose is fine. And if you did accomplish uh, in a parallel world, uh, you know that discovery, you could you could then write a book and win the Nobel Prize. So that's right. So that's it sounds win -win. strategic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a win-win situation. It is. It is. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Paulo, for joining us for this brief uh, conversation. Uh, thank you, Elder. And we share the same birth date, uh, well, birth year. Uh, and you have, I was just mentioning this um, off the record uh, before we, we came uh, live. Uh, and you have accomplished so many things. Uh, and I, I can only... Envy, envy you and wish you all the best uh, you. with your future, uh, you know, uh, projects and books and whatnot. Thank you so and much. Next time, next time we'll do this again in presence in yeah. Lisbona. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully, or in Italy. Why not? Or in Italy. Yeah. Okay. By a by a you choose the the city and I'll go there. Okay. It, Thanks it very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much.
Muito obrigado também a todos os que acompanharam esta sessão, isto foi muito rápido, havia tantas outras perguntas que gostaríamos todos de ter feito ao Paulo Giordano. O Ler Olhos nos Olhos regressa no dia 25 de novembro com o Frederico Lourenço, uma conversa que terá a moderação de Francisco José Viegas. Até lá então, fiquem atentos ao Ler Olhos nos Olhos e mais uma vez, muito obrigado. Thank you, Paulo. See you next obrigado. time. Obrigado. Tchau. Tchau a todos.